Hello there and welcome back to a course in Cognitive Linguistics and in this episode I want to talk about usage-based linguistics. What is usage-based linguistics? It's maybe not as flashy a topic as conceptual metaphor or blending theory but it's a very important topic. It's one that defines cognitive linguistics as a theory of language and to get us started I brought you a little quote that I want to read to you. Okay, here it goes. The changes in language fulfill themselves in the individual, partly through spontaneous activity by means of speaking and thinking in the forms of language, and partly through the influence which each individual receives from others. A change in linguistic usage can hardly be brought about without the cooperation of both. Okay, what this quote does is that it brings together the ideas of language use, knowledge of language, and language change, and it shows how the three are interrelated. Yeah? Usage of language influences your knowledge of language and through many instances of mutual influence between the individuals that talk to one another, we get language change that unfolds over decades and centuries. Now this is a very modern sounding idea, but actually it has been formulated in this way by Hermann Powell about a century ago. So Hermann Powell you can think of as the great-grandfather of usage-based linguistics. Usage-based linguistics can be circumscribed in terms of a number of core ideas and two of these core ideas you've just encountered in the Hermann Powell quote, namely that language use shapes linguistic knowledge and that language use shapes language change. Beyond that, usage-based linguistics also subscribes to a number of functionalist ideas such as communicative functions, shape, language, form, and it also is based on the cognitive idea that language is grounded in general cognitive processes. I'll say more about this in just a minute. Right, um, one of the main architects of present-day usage-based linguistics is Joan Bybee, and most of the ideas that I'll present in this video are straight from her 2010 book, Language Usage and cognition. Now when I say straight from that book I'm only being half honest because really this video is a shameless ripoff of a review article of that book that was written by Holger Diesel and um, Holger synthesized John Bybee's ideas in 10 claims of usage-based linguistics that I'm going to present in the following minutes. So let's dig right in and start with the first and most important claim namely that language is grounded in domain general cognitive processes. Um, these processes are things like categorization, chunking, rich memory, analogy, and cross-modal association, and they are processes that underlie language, but that are also important for non-linguistic uh, non cognition, and some of them are even present in non-human species. Right. Um, why this focus on domain generality? What is the big deal? Well, the big deal is that for the longest time, linguists have assumed a language faculty in the brain that would allow young children to learn language, something that is hardwired into your genetic endowment that allows you to figure out how language works. And, well, this is sort of the bedrock of generative theory and with generative linguistics being, well, um, well, for the longest time, generative linguistics has been the mainstream uh, linguistic theory, and so any competitor to that theory had better demonstrate that you actually don't need this language faculty. Language learning works just on the basis of domain general cognitive processes, and that is what makes these processes so important for usage-based linguistics. Okay, um, let me start with the first of these processes that I mentioned, uh, categorization. I already talked about categorization in a separate video. The main idea is that human beings generalize over multiple events that are experienced as the same at some level. So categories like bird or dog or breakfast or also linguistic categories like relative clause, noun, subject, they are formed through experience and that means that categories have central members that are experienced very often and peripheral non-central members that are experienced only occasionally. 
right? If you're interested, uh, watch the video. Um, the second process is the one of chunking. Um, chunking means that human beings acquire routines in their behavior. I've given you the example of a tennis serve here, which is a fantastically complex activity, you know, a sequence of activities that nonetheless through practice becomes represented as a single holistic unit. Um, now with regard to language, you can capture this general idea with the slogan, words that are used together, fuse together. So when I'm producing a collocation, such as, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have to assemble this thing from scratch, thinking of each word and then arranging those words in a phrase structure. Rather, I can access the whole thing at once and producing it at once so that it just rolls off the tongue like that. Right, so that's chunking. <clears throat> the next process is um, memorization, rich memory. That's a cornerstone of the usage-based paradigm, the idea that speakers have rich repertoires of uh, language memorized. And this is an idea that early linguistics really shunned away from because it was influenced by computer science. And in early computers, storage was relatively expensive, uh, while computation was quite cheap. Yeah? So the logic was that everything that um, <clears throat> has to be memorized is sort of uh, bad, and things that we can derive by rule, that is good. Now, early cognitive science adopted the view that the mind is in some way like a computer, yeah? like an old school computer, and uh, everything that can be derived by rule need not be memorized. So um, that there was a focus on the rules and all the rest that was sort of put aside as undesirable. Okay, now time has shown that in human brains um, storage is actually quite cheap, whereas computation is relatively expensive and also relatively error prone. Um, by now there's psycholinguistic evidence that speakers retain very rich and detailed memory even of forms that are technically redundant that you wouldn't need to remember because they're fully rule-based. For instance, the plural of cat, cats, you know that, um, is fully rule-based and you wouldn't have to memorize the plural of cat. Nonetheless, it seems that people do. Yeah? Or take walked as the past tense of walk. Also, that is fully rule-based. It would be enough to memorize something like the plural allomorphy rule of English or the past tense allomorphy rule of English and not having to memorize things like walked or cats or other regular plurals and past tenses. Nonetheless, people do memorize. Right. Um, the next process is the process of analogy, which is often represented in this formula-like uh, format. A is to B like X is to something else. Uh, I've given you a visual example of analogy. If you look at those two pictures, um, which element of the first picture corresponds to which element in the second picture? Now, you see that both pictures show a child. So a natural answer would be to say, well, the, the children, they, they are very similar. But what most people actually say is that, well, there's this child in the first picture that is kind of similar to the flower in the second picture. Isn't that weird? Yeah. But of course, you know why they say that. They say that because there's a structural similarity across the two pictures. Yeah? In each picture, there's a giver of water and a receiver of water. And the receiver of water is the child in the first picture and the flower in the second picture. And this is so salient to people that they say, well, the child and the flower, they're, they're really similar. <laughs> analogy, the power of analogy. Um, in language, analogy shows up, for instance, in the regularization of irregular verb forms. Yeah. Um, dream has the irregular past tense dreamt. Uh, but it is being regularized to dreamed. That's a process of analogy because there are verbs like scream that work in that way. Or the first person who was clever enough to say, I'm so underwhelmed by this, um, they figured out that, okay, 
over is to overwhelm, like under is to something, and this something is underwhelm and it has a certain meaning. Right, and it's funny for a couple of years. Um, right. Okay, that's an analogy. Uh, by the way, if you have a bit of time, uh, there's a great video on analogy by Doug Hofstadter, uh, one of my all-time heroes. Uh, I think I'll put a link in here if I find it. All right, analogy. <clears throat> the last skill that I want to mention is cross-modal association, which is the ability to associate a stimulus with a contiguous experience. Um, made famous by Pavlov and his dogs, and, uh, well, emblematic for humans, of course, are links between linguistic sounds and meanings, but basically all kinds of symbolic relations. This is important if you want to get language off the ground. Right, so here we have a couple of domain general cognitive processes, uh, categorization, chunking, memory, analogy, and cross-modal association. That's not an exhaustive list. There are other processes that are important that I don't discuss in this video. For instance, joint attention, intention reading, and also metaphor. That was the topic of another video. Okay, the second claim of usage-based linguistics is that the synchronic analysis of grammar cannot be separated from diachrony. If you've sat through an intro to linguistics, you will have come across the chess metaphor of language, that language is, well, that the rules of language are like a like the rules of chess and that a conversation that you have in language is like a game of chess. The individual conversations, they are different, they're all a little different, but the underlying rules, they are the same. Okay, um, now usage-based linguistics departs in some way from this um, research program of structuralism that studied the synchronic rule system on its own terms. Yeah? Um, so usage-based linguistics tries to understand the current state of the system not as a thing in itself, but as a result of language change, as a result of diachronic development. So in a way, usage-based linguistics take an evolutionary perspective, something that biologists have done for a long time, and um, sort of take the perspective that little in linguistics makes sense except in the light of language change. If we want to know why language is the way it is, we have to understand how it came to be that way. Right. Um, what evidence is there to you know, put a bit of meat on that, uh, that skeleton of a claim? Well, principles of diachron uh, diachronic language change explain, for instance, why cross-linguistically many grammatical forms have common lexical origins. For instance, future markers. They tend to derive from verbs of movement, or come and go, or from verbs of desire, will, for instance, or from verbs of obligation, shall. Yeah. So this is not a coincidence of just English that we have will, shall, and be going to, but rather this is something that we find all over the globe. These verbs tend to develop into future markers. <clears throat> um, Another interesting thing is that uh, principles of diachronic language change explain why they are why there are uh, so-called implicational universals. Implicational universals are things such as uh, no language has a dual unless it also has a plural. So every language that you find that has a dual, you can be sure that it also has a plural. Why should that be? Well. It really has a fairly trivial explanation. There are more situations in which you might want to talk about a set of many things, yeah, unspecified with regard to number, than situations in which you talk about a set of exactly two things. Yeah. So a dual is a much more specific tool than the plural, and so it is used less often. Um, this relates to a thing that um, um, Jack Dubois said, uh, grammars code best what speakers do most. <clears throat> um, a third idea in relation to this is that principles of diachronic language change explain why there is gradients and variation in synchronic usage, because the forms and meanings of language 
are always subject to change. Yeah? You remember the Paul quote, uh, individuals are influenced by each other, they update their mental representation, they talk a little differently on the next occasion. So this means that any linguistic unit will exhibit variation, different usage patterns in different speakers. And this is something that you see all over the place. Uh, if we stay with the example of be going to um, the different realizations of this construction. I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm gone, I'm a, yeah, those are different variants of the same construction. And uh, this is explained by diachronic change. Okay, another important point that separates usage-based linguistics from earlier traditions is that, um, well, children's first language acquisition is not the only source of language change. In generative theory, intergener intergenerational transmission is the prime location for a language change to happen. But in usage-based linguistics, it's really the idea that language changes over the lifetime. You constantly update your mental representation of linguistic knowledge. Okay, what evidence is there to suggest that kids aren't the only drivers of language change? Well, um, there's the observation that children's deviant uses do not persist. For instance, English-speaking children uh, make a lot of errors in which they show consonant harmony, saying giga when they talk about a guitar. Yeah. Why does this not catch on? Why does this not become the regular way of referring to a guitar? It disappears. Or consonant cluster reduction. To be sure that there is consonant cluster reduction in language change, but many instances of consonant cluster reduction that you find in child speech don't survive in adult speech. So toast, eventually all the kids go and say toast. Um, many kids' errors also do, do not resemble the changes that are found in the historical records. So things like overgeneralization or copula deletion, yes, they're there, but nonetheless, uh, children recover from overgeneralization and in many varieties of English copula deletion is found in child language but not in adult language. Right, and then finally, on the more positive side, uh, we see that adults also exhibit changes in language use, say when they move into uh, the territory of, of a new dialect, a new variety. There are changes in vocabulary, in vowel quality, and in prosody. Okay. Um, thirdly, third claim of usage-based linguistics is that frequency is an important determinant of language change. There are two frequency effects that are central, uh, namely the effects of reduction and preservation. Um, the frequency effect of reduction means that the more frequently a string of linguistic forms is produced, the more likely it is to form a chunk and to undergo articulatory reduction. So for instance, if uh, someone asks you a question and you have no response and you say, I don't know, I don't know is something that you said very, very often, that you've heard very often, and so it is memorized as a chunk and it is produced in a very reduced fashion, I don't know. Yeah, you can record my utterance of I don't know there, put it into prod, look at it, check out the vowels, it's very reduced. Compare that to people saying things like we don't negotiate. Yeah, um, the same linguistic element, don't, is produced in a much more elaborate fashion in these less frequent strings. Okay, so high frequency usually goes together with strong reduction, but it also goes together with preservation, uh, which sort of goes in the opposite direction, right? Um, the more frequently a linguistic form is produced, the more entrenched it becomes in memory, and hence the more resistant it becomes to analogical change. So um, the past tense of weep, wept, is frequently regularized to weep. Um, the same doesn't happen with slept, because slept is very, very much more frequent than wept. 
Okay, so people don't say sleeped because slept is so entrenched in their mind. Wept is only weakly entrenched and so it gets generalized to weep. That's the effect, the frequency effect of preservation. Okay. Um, coming to the fourth claim, linguistic categories are based on concrete tokens. This recapitulates uh, an idea that we've come across in the categorization episode. Um, experience of tokens leads speakers to the formation of exemplar-based categories. Every new token that you encounter joins the cloud of exemplars and alters the overall structure of the category. Um, new tokens that you come across, they are categorized in terms of similarity to already existing tokens, and there are central exemplars and peripheral exemplars. So, um, to take an example, if you look at these uh, vowels here in the vowel chart, say you have encountered all of these E's. Yeah? If the next E that you hear is right here in the middle, your category won't change. Yeah? It will remain the same, it will retain the same center of gravity. By contrast, if you hear an E that is out here somewhere, yeah, you might adjust your cloud of exemplars just a little bit so that the center of gravity moves a tiny bit into one direction. That is how exemplar-based categories can change over time. <clears throat> the fifth claim of usage-based linguistics is that syntactic structure is lexically specific, um, which is in direct contradiction to modular views of grammar in which syntax is separate from the lexicon. I've talked about this in terms of the dictionary and grammar view of linguistic knowledge. Yeah? Um, so in the usage-based worldview, uh, grammatical constructions are associated with lexical material. Um, and this is because speakers don't hear syntactic forms in isolation from uh, lexical material. They always hear the two together. So generalization over syntactic patterns are made with reference to the lexical material they contain. Um, this squares with uh, the, the construction grammar idea that I'll talk about later, that syntactic constructions have slots that are biased towards specific lexical elements. So for instance, the ditransitive construction frequently contains uh, verbs such as give, tell, send, offer, or show. The so-called into-causative construction, they tricked me into signing the contract, has verbs such as trick, fool, coerce, force, or mislead. And the imperative, the English imperative, if you look at corpus data, most of the examples are let's, yeah, look, uh, see if we can find this, listen, don't worry, things like that. So syntactic structure is intimately bound up with a lexical material that is usually found in it. <clears throat> a sixth claim that also relates to the idea of categorization is that grammatical categories are gradient. Um, classical categories are sharply defined, prototype categories are fuzzy, and linguistic categories aren't classical categories, they're prototype categories. That is gradient and organized around prototypical members. Um, so if grammar is shaped through experience with concrete tokens, uh, some tokens will be very similar to what we have encountered before and others less so, leading to the structure of central exemplars and peripheral exemplars. Um, categories, grammatical categories, emerge as the sum totals of our experience with a form that we count as the same, as a relative clause or a subject or a noun. And change happens as more and more peripheral members of a category are encountered. You remember the example I just gave with the E that is just a little bit off the already established cloud of exemplars. Another example of gradients in grammatical categories is uh, Dabrowska's 2008 study of WH questions. There are WH questions that are very typical. Yeah? What do you think the witness will say? And there are very unprototypical realizations of uh, WH questions with long distance dependency. For instance, what would Claire believe that Joe thinks the witness will say is a lot clumsier than what do you think the witness will say, which nicely rolls off the tongue. 
So here we have um, acceptability judgments from native speakers who find that the prototypical WH question sounds a lot better than the unprototypical WH question. Coming back to chunking, um, usage-based theory has a particular story with regard to constituent structure with uh, which, well, if you sat through an intro class in linguistics, is modeled as a discrete tree diagram or a bracketed structure. Yeah? You remember old men and women and old men and women, which have different bracketing structures or different tree structures. Now, the usage-based idea is that things are not as clear-cut as that. So, syntactic constituency exists, yeah? no doubt about that, but uh, it's not as discrete as the trees or the bracketing suggests. There are changes in constituency that can happen over time. And um, the syntactic constituency that we have in the current system comes about as the result of chunking, that is the reanalysis of a complex string as a holistic unit. Let me explain that in a bit more detail. Here we have an example of different sentences and their constituent structure. So take an example like I was just waiting for the bus. Waiting for the bus there is a verb phrase and um, in English you can raise objects out of verb phrases and front them. So you can say things like that's the bus I was waiting for. Yeah. Okay, now um, <clears throat> English has a set of syntactic constraints that are very famous, that are known under the label of island constraints. And, well, these constraints do several things. One of the things that they do is that you cannot raise an object out of a coordinated verb phrase. So, for instance, if you have the sentence, I was just singing and waiting for the bus. Yes, yeah, sorry about the silly example, but I needed a coordinated verb phrase. Uh, you cannot raise the bus out of this coordinated verb phrase. So you can say things like, that's the bus I was singing and waiting for. Okay, you with me so far? Okay. Now, um, now compare, I was just singing and waiting for the bus to the sentence, I was just sitting and waiting for the bus. This looks like a coordinated verb phrase, but um, through repeated use, sitting and waiting has changed in its constituency. It has become a single constituent. I was sitting and waiting for the bus. With the consequence that you can now raise the bus out of this seemingly coordinated verb phrase, sitting and waiting for the bus. So speakers of English actually can say, that's the bus I was sitting and waiting for. Okay? Whereas they can say, that's the bus I was singing and waiting for. So this is evidence that over time, through repeated use, constituency can change and things can be chunked together so that constituency borders are erased and redrawn um, in this way. Okay. I'm coming to the eighth uh, claim and that claim relates to the video on polysemy that I did earlier. So constructions are polysemous. Here uh, you've seen this picture before that concerns the preposition in and how the preposition in can have different meanings. So the fish is in the ball. I'll see you in 10 minutes. That is in that book and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, English constructions are polysemous just as lexical items are polysemous. So the English auxiliary word will has more meanings than just future meanings. It um, marks habituality, epistemic modality, and uh, different kind of discourse, marky things um, that, if you will, is the heart of the issue. The English ditransitive construction encodes basically a transfer of an object uh, from a sender to a recipient, but it can also encode future transfer, denied transfer, uh, a transfer that is only promised, an inverted transfer, or just communication. So basic message if you're interested go back to the polysemy video uh, there I explain things in more detail. 
Right. Um, the ninth claim goes back to the cognitive skill of analogy <clears throat> uh, and concerns linguistic productivity, which is seen as an outcome of analogy rather than as an outcome of rules. Um, in the productivity literature, which is massive, uh, there are two opposing views that you can identify um, that you could characterize as the discrete all or nothing view or a gradient view. Discrete means that a rule is either productive or it's unproductive. The gradient view means that a schema can be more or less productive. Uh, the usage-based paradigm rethinks rules that are considered as all or nothing as schemas that can be more or less productive. So a schema is a template for new linguistic forms that are created through generalization over existing forms. So if you have in your mental representation of language the words goodness, fairness, fitness, awareness, darkness, and so on and so forth, you arrive at a generalization that is the adjectiveness schema that is associated with meaning, the quality of being adjective. Um, these schemas have restrictions. They are not fully productive, but no, productive with ifs, ands, and buts. So strongness doesn't work, blueness doesn't work, and a couple of other nesses don't work either. And you, as a speaker, know that. <clears throat> so, how does analogy come in? Well, we've already talked about the two pictures and the relation of dreamed and dream and seem and seen. Analogy depends really on two factors that come in. One is type frequency. With how many different types does the schema occur? How many different nest words do you know? Or how many verbs that end in the past tense ed do you know? That is the type frequency. And the greater the type frequency, the greater the likelihood that the schema will produce new types. The second factor is similarity. Uh, given a formula such as a is to be like x is to something, how similar are a and x? With seem and dream, we have a strong phonological similarity. Um, but sometimes also semantic similarity is important for analogy. So for instance, there are lots of verbs that take that clauses in English. Uh, Smith writes that Jones is wrong, argues that Jones is wrong, claims that Jones is wrong, and so on and so forth. So. If you form an analogy on the basis of this set of verbs, you might come up with an example like Smith defines that constructions are form meaning pairs. Yeah. Uh, it's an example that sounds odd to many native speakers, but you can see the semantic reasoning behind uh, this innovation analogy. Now, what about the differences between analogy and rules? Analogies are sensitive to type frequencies, rules are not. Analogies are influenced by phonological and semantic similarity, again, rules are not. Analogy involves both form and meaning, whereas rules are really restricted to form. And analogy motivates a gradient view of productivity, whereas the discrete rule-based view uh, is a categorical thing. I'm coming to the tenth and final claim uh, for this video, uh, namely that language universals are dynamic and probabilistic, not absolute. Uh, here you see a picture of a sample of the world's languages, and what you see in the dots are basic word order patterns. So you see lots of blue dots, which represent SOV word order, lots of red dots, SVO, then a um, couple of yellow dots, VSO, few red, uh, few yellow diamonds, very few red diamonds, and almost no blue diamonds. So what you can see easily is that the blue and red circles may predominate. Yeah? SOV and SVO, they are the most common word orders typologically. And um, that is uh, a universal. Yeah? Um, however, <clears throat> most universals have exceptions. There are, after all, OVS languages. And um, turning to other structural features, there are languages without recursion or without number um, that go against the grain of the rest of languages. Now, 
What is positive in the usage-based paradigm is that the true universals of language really are universals of change. Things such as grammatical forms develop out of lexical forms, or frequent forms tend to undergo reduction over time, or low-frequency forms tend to undergo regularization more easily than high-frequency forms. These things happen in all languages, and so the real universals of language in Matsek are concerning the way in which languages change. Right. Um, why do languages change in highly similar ways? Well, they change because the, the, the cognitive uh, processes that drive these processes are the same for all human beings. So language change is driven by language use, and language use in turn is shaped by the domain general cognitive processes that are the same for everybody. All human beings categorize, form analogies, memorize things, chunk things. Yeah? These are the same regardless of who you are, where you live, and um, all the rest. Okay, I'm coming back to this slide which has four of the main ideas of usage-based linguistics that language use shapes linguistic knowledge, language use shapes language change, communicative functions shape language form, and most importantly language is grounded in general cognitive processes. Okay, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.